Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 40 Oti podcast. Thank you very much for joining me and my lovely guest today to talk about something that's a little bit different to our normal topics, I suppose. It's something that I found very interesting and, and it's, it's piqued my interest a lot. And today I've got Lottie here to talk about her experience in being wrongly misdiagnosed and admitted to a hospital. Lottie, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be talking to you. Um, yeah, so you're doing good. You, you, you're a little bit different to some of the other guests that I've had on because you, you put a lot of work into like structuring um, what you were going to say and stuff. You sent me like some, some documents and stuff about uh, what you wanted to talk about and stuff. So I can tell that you, you really want to do this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was just really excited and I guess um I have a lot to say and I, I just wanted to you know let people know my experiences and I didn't really want to miss anything and um so yeah I was really I really got into it I think um it's good to have like a an outlet a voice to um yeah. let people in the world know about all the negatives and positives of being in this world I suppose <laughs> yeah exactly I want to be like as honest as I can because that's the most important thing and yeah just sort of tell my story I guess would you like to give us a little bit of a introduction into who you are and what you do yeah sure um so I'm Lottie I love photography um I have done photography for as long as I can remember really um at the moment that's a bit it's a bit impossible to do photography yeah of course (laughs) yeah um so I'm just sort of in my garden sort of just taking pictures of my dog really which isn't as thrilling as portraits which is what I like to do but um keeps me busy which is good because we are we are currently in the uh the covid isolation period I don't know whether when when this goes out we will still be in it but hopefully not Hopefully not. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's, it's been a really crazy time, but um, keeping positive and just getting through it, I guess. That's all you can do. And you have a Instagram page that you um, share some stuff about autism. and. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I started, I honestly have not been on, I haven't had that account that long. I guess there are a few reasons why I started my Instagram page. I I mean I'll go into reasons later but I just I just love meeting lots of other people who are autistic too and just you know talking about our experiences and stuff like that and everyone on Instagram in that community are just so lovely and I've met so many lovely people (laughs) honestly and it's just like an amazing thing to be part of so I'm really grateful for that. And um, what are you well, what were you um, working as before um, all of this craziness? <laughs> yeah, um, so before I was a nanny, I did sort of part-time nannying and also on the side I did photography. I did a lot of photography sort of towards the end of last year where I was sort of working with various people, doing lots of cool shoots. Um, but then it sort of, I don't know, maybe... I got a bit anxious and then just sort of you know went away from that for a while but now being in isolation I've had all this time to think and now I just want to get back to it so you know it's my passion at the end of the day so I just love it I really want to get back to it as soon as possible really. Well I've um I've had a look at your your photography page and honestly like some of the 
the photos that you've taken are like top standard, if I can say. Oh, they really are brilliant. Oh, thank you so much. I saw on your page initially that you you sort of did photography and stuff, but like, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, most of my photos are portraits. I just there's something just so special about you know um, portraits and just photography in general. I feel like photography gives me another language it sort of it's like I'm able to speak through the portrait sort of expressing things that I couldn't probably communicate as easily verbally Mm -hmm. and obviously I love the practical element of it because I'm definitely not one to sit still or sit sort of at an office or you know do that kind of job I just I love to be on the go and just being outside just I love it yeah it's definitely where I feel most free and happy so I definitely empathize with the sort of expressing things that you can't particularly explain because I feel like yeah verbal verbal like expression only only goes to a certain extent as there's, there's only so many words in the English yeah in the English language and any language to be honest that can sort of describe things but I feel I feel like like things like photography and art and and music and stuff they have so that that quality where you can try 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 your best to encapsulate a certain feeling or a, or a yeah um, emotion or an experience and create it into something yeah that shows other people a, a more sort of full of you of what you're trying to put across rather than you know putting it through words yeah exactly it's very personal I think art and every artist is unique because. Nobody can really recreate a photo you've taken, particularly in photography, because obviously you have to be there at the right time, at the right moment, clicking the camera at the right time. So I I feel like with photography, it's everyone's, all photographers are unique because nobody can copy a photo really. And everyone has their own emotions behind the photographs and what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to portray. It's, it's, yeah, it's a great feeling to be able to sort of just, I don't know, create emotion that you can't, yeah, verbalise, I guess. It's good to have a creative outlet. Yeah. We did also have a little bit of a sort of pre-chat before we started recording about um, sort of your writing and stuff, and you told me that you were writing a book. Yes. I I guess, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a writer. I, I've I mean, I guess now I am, <laughs> but I've I've never <laughs> I've I'm dyslexic and I I've never been that confident in my writing abilities. I mean, I love it. I I love writing, but I never had the confidence to actually, you know, decide to write a book and to do that. Yeah, I I just I really love it, and I just again it's sort of similar to um, photography because you can you can say you can speak as much as you know you want but sometimes writing it down on paper or typing it is just you you're able to get out a lot more than I feel you would be able to when you're speaking and yeah it's it's creative there's there's not really many rules obviously there are rules when it comes to writing but you're free to write whatever you want and you can kind of offload anything and everything and yeah I just I just find it really therapeutic it, it sort of like gets things off your mind doesn't it yeah it's like you have all these you could have all these ideas and thoughts sort of buzzing buzzing around you in your head but until you actually put it down mm-hmm. it's it's hard to sort of concentrate on anything else it's yeah. like with I know that that writing is is often quite you know like doing a diary and stuff is is obviously quite therapeutic in terms of sort of yeah getting things out plainly and explaining it and and putting it down and then obviously closing it and putting it away it gives you an outlet so that you don't have to keep yeah having those thoughts buzzing around in your head yeah definitely I totally agree with that um and I feel the same way it's just it's so freeing and yeah you can just I mean you're free to write anything it's it's really it's really helpful for me almost like a type of like meditation yeah I think I I totally agree I think it is to be honest yeah it's really helpful um I love I love you know being able to just 
write down whatever I want to write. <laughs> so yeah, today we're the sort of the, the main thing that we came on to talk about was the topic around misdiagnosis. And obviously misdiagnosis is a big deal because it affects how you're treated, it affects um all aspects of your life really. And if you obviously if you get misdiagnosed then it it can sometimes be catastrophic and and I think one thing about um your case it's the thing that you're you're here to to talk about is that it went really wrong for yeah. you in yeah. terms of being misdiagnosed and you sort of were, were diagnosed with sort of all these um types of mental disorders and stuff which which most of them now from what you've told me uh, prior to this aren't a part of your diagnosis am I right yeah so um what what sort of initiated your admission to the hospital like wh- when did you start getting diagnosed with all these things and what were they and why were you put into put into this hospital I guess I guess there are lots of reasons why I was obviously admitted into a psychiatric hospital like they didn't put me in there for no reason I guess it was a long build up of things deteriorating until it got to a point where I was basically just a big risk to myself um I was very very depressed and I wasn't safe at home and it finally got to the point where I suppose doctors had no choice but to section me under the mental health act which basically means I had no choice I had to go into hospital um at the time I I mean my initial diagnosis was PTSD and depression when I was diagnosed with PTSD and depression autism autism was actually mentioned by my psychiatrist at the time when I was 15 but nobody followed it up Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess their priority was my current mental health state, which was really declining by the minute. And that in their eyes needed treating really quickly. But I suppose before it was mentioned at age 15, I think I think people didn't pick up on it. Um, as I learned to mask a lot of things, I was seen as a very difficult child. and people just thought I had behavioral problems um but I guess they never looked into the root cause I mean I was actually diagnosed with dyslexia at age 11 I suppose that's when people first realized I wasn't just a difficult child there were you know more things going on so yeah I mean I guess that's yeah that's what happened (laughs) so the the reason why you were that were put into the psychi- psychiatric hospital is because you were sort of harboring a lot of sort of dangerous thoughts towards yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much the reason. And I had actually, um, you know, acted on those thoughts when I was just fifteen before, you know, I was in the hospital. So I mean, it, it was, you know, it wasn't a good place, and I wasn't in a good place. And they sort of they had to act you know quickly i guess hmm well it's 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 very it's very strange for me to 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 like hear that because i I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety along with some dissociative disorders when i was about 14 as well and i i sort of um went through well to to be honest i I sort of dip in and out of it but i i went through a lot of cycles of quite severe depression and since since the age of 14 at harbored a lot of like you know like suicidal thoughts and stuff and mm-hmm. i made a few f- a very poor <laughs> attempts on my life if that, if that could be poor it's mm. probably a good thing isn't it but <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> and um i i i never really was it was introduced or or the, they never saw a concern for for me to be put into a to to that kind of thing when I was when I was that age, so it's it's very strange for me to to hear to hear that because it's obviously very much in the hands mm. of other people, I suppose, as to whether 
you get sectioned or stuff like that? I think it does come down to the individual doctor. I mean, I guess they have a set process they go through um, with every person. But yeah, I guess I guess I it had been I had a long period of time where you know they were trying to keep me out of hospital. It wasn't just like a sudden right. This has happened. You need to go into hospital. It was it was a long stretch of time where things were just deteriorating. I was you know being brought into the emergency department more and more and more, and um, I think finally they just it got to the point where you know that couldn't carry on it wasn't fair on me and it wasn't fair on my parents either mm. so I guess they were left with no choice really yeah um and were the were the times that you were you were admitted was it was it due to like um sort of like self-injury or was it attempts or yeah both really um I also think they had put me on medication which was really looking back detrimental for me really I had a lot of reactions to the medications and I think looking back it just made me so much worse um and I I I do think that contributed as well to my mental state declining and me ending up in hospital but obviously there was no sort of evidence Mm -hmm. you know that I I that was happening that the medication was making me worse and what what types of medications we we put on sort of prior to to it was it antidepressants oh, everything and anything really <laughs> <laughs> um, a cocktail it was yeah pretty much it was antidepressants antipsychotics um, mood stabilizers you know tranquilizers Whoa. just honestly I, I, I mean I, I was 15 and i was on an probably two antipsychotics and no, I just don't think any fifteen-year-old should, you know, be put on an antipsychotic. Really. And what 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 was the reasoning? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think my, I think looking back, they they thought I had periods of psychosis, but I think really, it was just you know meltdowns or shutdowns. I I sort of lost my ability to speak in those episodes and yeah became really my behavior became quite extreme and I wouldn't be able to communicate and you know there'd be a lot of shouting I think I think a lot also a lot of frustration because I couldn't communicate you know I just I just lost my ability to communicate and I think maybe to them that looked like psychosis just because I wasn't communicating. I, I was unable to speak. I, you know, I was doing kind of, I guess, strange things. I, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds a lot like, t- t- to me, it sounds a lot like a typical meltdown, to be honest. like Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what I, I think looking back, it really, it really was a meltdown. I mean, I've had meltdowns throughout my whole life and it was pretty much the same as, when I was younger, except I guess there were, I was more, it was a bit more extreme just because I don't know, I was older, I was, you know, stronger. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that's what it was. There, there, there's a book that I'm, I'm, I'm currently reading, which is, I think, you know, I've, I've said, I said this in the last, last podcast, but I need to sort of, it's, it's called The Self Illusion by this guy oh, called yeah. Bruce Hood. And he's, he sort of goes yeah. in about, you know, uh, all the aspects of what we consider to be the self and stuff. And he's got a particular um, sort of chapter or two on sort of like adolescence and, and, and children and stuff. And mm-hmm. they, he said that there's, there's a specific uh, part of your brain that, that is responsible for sort of inhibiting actions, inhibiting behavior. Oh, yeah. So stopping stopping behaviors and looking back at my life there is definitely a big difference between meltdowns when I was younger and meltdowns that I have now like yeah I feel like there was a lot more of that sort of anger frustration component to my meltdowns when I was younger as opposed to now Mm -hmm. 
I can in in terms of like you know the the crossover with like psychotic episodes. It's it it's mind boggling that that nobody sort of understood <laughs> like or just yeah. said hey yeah. maybe she's not having a um psychotic episode maybe she's having a meltdown and she's autistic so yeah like i know that that when when you have meltdowns particularly for me there's a lot of sort of self injuring kind of behavior for me cuz you know you know when yeah. you get into when you have like meltdowns it feels like your brain's sort of going around in this massive sort of spiraling thought loop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Every time that you feel like you're calming down, your brain sort of goes haywire again, and you sometimes, yeah. sometimes you sort of like try to. What I do, I I sort of hit myself in the head when that happens. So I can sort of see some aspects that that may be considered to be fairly psychotic, but it's just it's, it's crazy, right? I know, I know. I think that when it gets, you know, written on paper, you know, that I have psychotic episodes or whatever, I think that's on, you know, my records for the rest of my life. So I think it just gets passed on to each psychiatrist that I'm with and they just sort of, you know, see that and just yeah. carry on believing that. I think it's hard to sort of break that that belief. Yeah, I can imagine that's 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 yeah. crazy was it sort of um a joint decision with your parents to to um get section or is it no, more of the no. doctor yeah you you have to there's quite a long there's quite a long process that you have to go through um for them to section you you have to your psychiatrist has to you know believe that that's the best option then they have to get another psychiatrist who isn't doesn't belong to the hospital or anything um who's completely separate to then assess the situation and also agree and then they have to get a social worker as well and you know it's it's a big it's a big process to have to go through and you're just sort of you know having to talk to so many people and it's it's very very stressful and you know I, I was sort of you know constantly was trying to fight my case to stay out of hospital but you know, always ended up them just sectioning yeah. me. So it was really, really horrible. Mm, I can imagine. I'm sorry that yeah. that's happened. That that happened to you. Like, it's, yeah, it's it's hard to hear. I mean, I'm in a better place now, and I've been free of hospital for you know a good few months now, which is actually the longest time I've been free of hospital in the last few years, which is you know amazing. I'm in such a better place so I'm really really glad that that's the case really never again <laughs> never <laughs> happening again yeah um the ne- next question that I sort of want- wanted to ask you was what were you uh, diagnosed at that time with and um, why do you think that they they didn't realize that you were autistic at the time so my initial diagnosis was I think I've mentioned this but it was PTSD and depression and they you know there was a reason behind the PTSD and there was a reason behind the depression so I understood that um you know that that was a fact I I did have PTSD and I I was depressed but as as the years went on I suppose um you know my diagnosis changed and you know they they diagnosed me with OCD, bipolar affective disorder, borderline personality disorder. I also had an eating disorder. I think, I mean, the the real, you know, the correct diagnosis was depression. I, I, you know, that was, you know, that was a fact. But as the years went on, it just, you know, it all changed. And they started labeling me with all these things that just, weren't correct like I would I would relate to them to some extent but it really didn't explain you know my whole life and you know what all the other things that were going on so yeah it was they were yeah they they, I really was you know misdiagnosed and autism I mean it was mentioned when I was 15 
Um, but yeah, but they didn't follow it up. They didn't follow it up, and um, yeah, it was it's frustrating to look back and you know look back on it and just see how misunderstood I was. Um, I mean, it, I had I I. I'd never thought about this before, but I sort of went through all the hostel emissions I've been, I've had, and, you know, it was 18 hostel emissions before, you know, somebody finally was like, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I, I, you know, I think, I think you need to go for a second opinion. And when I went for that second opinion, the psychiatrist immediately said he thought I was autistic. And he was really quick to um, refer me for an autism assessment. Yeah, so it's just interesting how, you know, having a different, a new pair of eyes just to look on the situation and. Yeah. Yeah. But I could, I could sort of just by, just by sort of thinking, thinking about it, I could sort of see, you know, because because of all of the sort of external factors that you were you were getting as well as. So obviously, as you said, you started off with sort of like depression and, and PTSD. Um, I can sort of see why that, you know, they, they might start leaning towards other diagnoses because you were put yeah. on so many different medications. Yeah. And that's bound to have an effect on how you function psychologically yeah. and physically. Like Totally, yeah. And then also the fact that you you know you're in and out of hospital having a lot of traumatic experiences mm. it it makes it makes sense to, to to some extent about why they might have misdiagnosed you yeah totally yeah i mean it really it really Do you think... sorry go on <laughs> <laughs> it it really it really does i can, i can see i can see their point of view i can see why you know, you're right. I, I started out with depression and the more medications I could put on, the worse I got. And I can just see why they would assume all my issues were because of mental illness and why they didn't really think about anything else because, you know, they they really, I mean, nobody ever really asked me about you know, my childhood or anything like that. It was honestly, it was, it was my, the traumatic event that had happened when I was 14. Um, it was a ski accident and nobody really asked me before, well, you know, what was going on in my life before that. It was, you know, that was the big event that happened and that's why, you know, everything spiraled. But, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, happy before that anyway for a, you know, for most of my life. So yeah, nobody really, yeah. you know, I can see why why they would, you know, go along that route and why everything happened the way it did. But it is it is frustrating. Is the is this sort of the PTS side of things something that you that you want to talk about, or is it something that you? I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I can. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, it was a long time ago now, and. I'm really, you know, okay with it. Um, but basically, I used to ski race and I did a lot of training on like dry slopes in in England. And I had quite a big accident one night. And you know, from there on, I it was a long recovery process physically because of the head injury and you know various other things yeah. and um but looking back on it I think to be honest if I'm, if I'm really honest it, it wasn't a very dramatic accident it was the way my body physically and mentally responded to the accident like yeah. my my body was in shock for so long it reacted quite extreme and I think I've always been like that my mom always said you know she found it really hard to calm me down if I hurt myself or you know I would just I was, I was very dramatic when it comes to hurting myself but I feel like I, I feel pain a lot more so I, I don't know I don't know if that's you know me being autistic or something but yeah I I feel like my body reacted basically 
different to how maybe a neurotypical person would react to it yeah. basically yeah i get that i feel yeah. i feel like that well i mean that there is you know everyone has a different sort of sensory profile mm. and um me in particular i i can't i can't deal with sharp sort of i can't deal with like sharp pain mm. so anything like needles or yeah nettles yeah. or anything and or, or extreme heat or not not even extreme heat just like a hot shower or something yeah. can be more a lot more painful for me than than what other people would experience yeah and then on the other side i i have a very high in, insensitivity to sort of like dull pain mm-hmm. so because I, I I used to sort of be an athlete and stuff, and I used to fight in a sport called taekwondo, which is just oh, yeah. basically like boxing with your legs. Yeah. And I I am ex- extremely insensitive to dull pain, so I can mm. I could take a levering and be all right. But as soon as someone said that I was going to the dentist, I need to get a little needle in my oh, no. uh, in my gums. That would. Yeah, you know, I'd have to be sort of coaxed into it over the course yeah. of a few weeks. Mm. So yeah, I, f- I think you know, like sensitivity to, to to pain in autistic people can be different. Yeah, ac- according to each person, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but what what about the the depression side of things? Like, what's your your story with that? When did it sort of start? When did you start to get those feelings? And when did it? really sort of become an issue I think um it you know I started getting um depressed probably just around the time before my accident really um I lost a lot of friends I really wasn't enjoying anything and I was extremely anxious and then when I had the accident it sort of really kind of exaggerated that feeling because I was alone I was out of school and it really made things spiral but yeah I mean I haven't you know always been you know a happy bubbly you know full of life person I've always had struggles and barriers in life and I I feel like that really affected my sort of self-esteem and confidence. So, you know, as the years went on, that sort of just got less and less. And, you know, it was only, it only needed like one thing like that accident to really trigger everything. And tip you over. Yeah, tip me over. And uh, yeah, so I think maybe for a huge part of my life, I was depressed, but it was really obvious. Yeah around that time of my accident so did you sort of show signs of depression when you were sort of uh pre-adolescent I or mean, was it something that that came on you know when yeah puberty came about <laughs> yeah um I mean as a child you know my mama said from you know about the age of two I would sort of harm myself I you know I would hit my head I would just do you know pick mm-hmm. up my skin I would just do you know things like that and that that carried on throughout my whole life and I feel like because I was the first child you know my you know my mum didn't really know what you know what was right and what was wrong you know she just sort of thought that was you know me and she you know she accepted it but I I, I guess I guess before my accident my mum I think probably around I think it was around the age of 11. Um, my mum did try and get me to go to a psychologist, a therapist, because, you know, I had so many sort of fears in my life. I was, you know, imagining really horrible things were going to happen to various people. And it just, yeah, she, she wanted me to go and see a therapist. But obviously at the age of 11, when, you know, I, I didn't really understand myself, I, you know, thought, absolutely not I'm not I'm not doing that um it was a very scary thought so yeah nothing I didn't really get any support I suppose 
with how I was feeling but I didn't really know how I was feeling I wasn't aware I was feeling you know I didn't know what depression was so you got that aspect of um, finding it hard to understand emotions as well mm. with, the, with the autism and definitely stuff. and I found it really hard I got a lot better at this but I did find it really hard when I was younger to sort of express how I was feeling and talk to people about how I was feeling and you know mm-hmm. so I, I guess that was another reason as to why nobody really understood what was going on but yeah yeah because um uh, prior to sort of adolescent kind of age prior to like um 13 14 15 I was I was always a very kind of positive and, and bubbly little kid yeah I would go up and talk to people I would you know sometimes maybe a bit a little bit be be a little bit cautious and a little bit sort of anxious yeah. and afraid of of social interaction but it was I was always very different to how I was in adolescence so there was at, at some point a sort of a switch that just just clicked yeah yeah and I, I think to be honest most of that's I feel like I'm, I'm the, the majority of my sort of uh, difficulty with depression and stuff would be you know ne- neurochemical I, I I don't feel like a large part of my depression is something that I can do something about without you know there is a large aspect of managing it yeah. but the actual sort of feeling you know the well, now you I probably don't need to describe it for for you but you know yeah. feeling like nothing changes you know you feel out of your body sometimes yeah. you feel like you want to crawl up in a in a ball and just yeah yeah escape from things yeah and I do know from some from the sort of prior research that I did at uni that um, depression usually usually comes on as a a a consequence of chronic pain, yeah. whether it's physical pain, so like you know, like fibromyalgia and any sort of chronic illness, yeah, or chronic emotional pain, so like anxiety, bullying, all of that kind of stuff, and. I, I in my in my case I think the my depression came on as a result of the sort of emotional side mm. of things. I found it extremely difficult, especially like during secondary school when it when it got a little bit more crazy, yeah. the whole social yeah. world. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Secondary school was honestly an awful, awful place. I think it's it's really hard, especially if you know you're you're undiagnosed and you know you're sort of living a life of a neurotypical but maybe you know everyone expects so much of you and I just feel you know it's a tough place to be I mean it's you've got to learn how to sort of adapt to everything basically um it's, it's a very hard atmosphere to be in and I think yeah especially if you're autistic it's it's really hard um so um i i'm i'm really sort of interested in just the whole like psychiatric hospital kind of ex- experience it sounds like i'm 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 talking about it like it's like a holiday <laughs> retreat or something but um it's not intended that way believe yeah, yeah, me yeah. but i i i recently sort of watched a a film i can't remember it, what it was it was about this this girl who um was diagnosed with depression and she was sort of admitted into sort of a psychiatric hospital and she and she she's basically you know quite quite high functioning depression kind of person yeah and she was she was sort of surrounded by a lot of people with a lot of various sometimes extreme sort of personality and mood disorders and psychosis and stuff and when I sort of started chatting to you and, and asking you if, what what you wanted would want to talk about, and you, you mentioned that, I was like, "Well, I could, you know, I f- I thought that I could get a good ex- enough of an ex- experience from from watching it, but I wanted to, you know, know what it was actually like." Yeah. So what 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 was it like? <laughs> like yeah. What um... were the 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 workers like? What were the people like? Um, so 
so first of all the environment you know in a psychiatric hospital is extremely chaotic you know everyone's very unwell um you're surrounded by like you say people with sort of schizophrenia uh you know just psychotic illnesses basically it just makes it extremely hard it's a very lonely place because you know a lot of people are so unwell that you know they they can't really you know hold a normal conversation and so it's, it's just very lonely and the people the staff were also different I mean you know some some would treat me like an individual and others just sort of treat me like another patient which was really hard I think a lot of the time you know they're very busy and don't have time and but it's just yeah it's it's um it's really it's a really horrible environment especially if you know you're autistic and you have maybe sensory difficulties and you know it's it's really hard to adapt you know it's just you're basically being thrown into something which is totally you know totally different tank. to what yeah a shark tank something you've never you know imagined in your life could exist and it does exist and it's scary it's really really terrifying it's a terrifying environment to be in and and honestly I wouldn't wish it on anyone it's 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 horrible it's really horrible and um, I'm sort of try, trying to sort of envision what it would be like I mean bit being being autistic anyway I think there's a lot of anxieties around people because obviously we we miss out on some of the body language and, and facial expressions and, and tone tone of voice and context of conversation in in those sort of daily things yeah. or at least, at least on them in the moment um maybe maybe we can understand them in reflection but mm-hmm. i feel like there's a lot of anxiety around people because we, we, it's like we, we know less about people's intentions on the spot yeah to i, I think most autistic people would be able to <clears throat> sort of empathize with feeling like people are just they're so unpredictable yeah especially when you're younger yeah and i can't imagine what it would be like to be in that situation that you were in where to neurotypical standards those people are significantly unpredictable as well <laughs> yeah yeah no uh, it's i mean it's such an unpredictable unpredictable environment i mean usually those hospitals have around 20 to 25 beds in the hospital and it, and they're quite small they're you know they have the corridors with the rooms and then you know they have you know a little sitting area and maybe a dining room if you're lucky but it's it's a lot of people you know confined in a very small space and it and when everyone's you know unwell it is unpredictable and I mean yeah it's hard to know what anyone's going to do like because they're unwell let alone all the sort of with their intentions with social nuances yeah 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 so it's it's yeah it's incredibly unpredictable so could you could you take us through like a sort of typical day in a psychiatric hospital yeah (laughs) Yeah, sure. Um, so normally you get woken up for breakfast. That's around um, eight o'clock. And is that mandatory? <laughs> well, it's meant to be, but I slept through them waking me up countless <laughs> times. <laughs> I mean, honestly, they'd always have to get the toaster out for me at about midday just so I could have breakfast. Um but yeah, it's meant to be mandatory, but that was eight o'clock. Then around nine o'clock, you'd have to go and line up for medication. Mm-hmm. And that would take a long time because obviously there were like 20 to 25 patients and it's just a very long process. Do you like line up or do, yeah. do you just sort of stand in a group and people no, call No, it's a line. Out? It's a line. People can get quite, you know, Agitated. wound up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that happens. And then normally, if you're lucky, there's normally an activity just before lunchtime. 
it could be anything from painting to jewelry making if you're lucky and it's it's really to be honest those activities hardly ever happened I mean we were lucky if we got if there were enough staff to run the group but that was the time where you know there was a bit of structure in the day and you know you had the chance to actually keep yourself distracted and focus on something else other than thoughts going on in your head um so that I relied on I relied on those groups because it really did keep me going um but as I say they they hardly ever happened anyway then we'd have lunch about 12 o'clock and we that lasts about an hour and then um then it was just nothing all day I mean we just sort of I don't even know what I did with my time were you were you allowed to bring any sort of personal possessions or um so we were it depended I mean there were a lot of sort of things that you weren't allowed but I I did have a lot of things I brought with me sort of like coloring books and various other things um but for a huge part of the time you know I often wasn't allowed it because of safety concerns and it was you know it was it was hard not being able to have sort of home comforts but you know as as you get well again you know you're allowed more things and it, it sort of gets a little bit more manageable but yeah it's, it's really tough having things taken away from you I can imagine did you get mo- yeah. did you get to have like a mobile or yeah so apart from one time where I was in this quite extreme hospital I was allowed a phone which honestly was was a lifesaver because I could just speak you know speak to my parents you know FaceTime them just like you know talk to people and and sort of be out take my mind off that environment you know I was allowed a phone um I wasn't allowed out even on the hospital grounds they had a little sort of patio area outside which you know we were allowed out into it was just on we were on like the second floor in one hospital mm-hmm. so it was quite high up and it had quite high walls so like you could hardly see anything but it was a bit of sunlight at least yeah yeah it was it was tough it was really really tough and um so so what about your your interactions with some of the other people did you get did you get along with some people to some extent were there any sort of issues was there any you know like hiding and trading of medication and yeah there were I guess over the few years that I did make friends with some people in fact some of the people I met are still friends now like really good friends and um, I feel really lucky for that but a lot of the time, the majority of the time, there really weren't people to talk to. And as you mentioned, there was um, there was a lot of, not so much with the drugs we were being prescribed because you had to sort of take them in front of the nurses, but people did bring various substances and alcohol onto the wards. If they, if they had leave, they would come back with them. Yeah. Um, so that sort of, would you know if somebody came in you know with loads of alcohol it would just make the the ward environment so chaotic you know it was already chaotic but if that happened then it would just just go a bit crazy really but I you know I did meet some lovely people there um it's very a lot of people are very agitated in Mm -hmm. you know on those wards and it's not really a place to sort of make friends I would say um you just sort of want to focus on you know getting better and out of there really so yeah was there anyone who made your stay worse um I think the the first thing that comes to mind is um staff members who made it worse as opposed to patients I think a lot of the patients just sort of keep themselves to themselves Whereas you can come across staff members who, I mean, they're trained in mental health, but 
a lot of them really did not seem to have sort of a genuine, you know, empathy, empathy and understanding and, you know, what you should say to a person struggling and what you shouldn't say. So there are a lot of unhelpful comments and people who just, you know, said things that were really not helpful. And yeah, so that wasn't very helpful. And it would it would kind of make it even harder than it already was having, you know, staff member who staff members you rely on, you know, to talk to. But if, you know, they say the wrong things and they don't quite understand your situation or say the wrong things it's just it's just not helpful i can imagine that do you have any people who are you know like fairly sociopathic or psycho psychopathic or anything like that there or is it mostly sort of psychosis and depression i think you know there are specialist hospitals for people who are like really um like really really unwell and you know, you know, a danger to others and stuff like that. They wouldn't be on the type of ward I was on. They'd be on a sort of higher secure ward. Mm-hmm. I mean, at one point I was on a higher secure ward only because I was, you know, such high risk to myself that they couldn't, you know, manage me on that kind of basic level. But yeah, I mean, yeah, so we, I didn't really come across those sort of, people but you know there are a lot of psychotic illnesses and yeah that sort of thing it was that was probably the majority of the people that were on the wards really were there any sort of um times where you f- you felt you know do because obviously you, you when you're in psycho- psychiatric um hospital you are under the care of a certain organization or mm-hmm medical system Mm -hmm. were were there any times where you felt a bit dehumanized from your experiences yeah yeah I think so I think as I said like a lot of the nurses sort of treated you as I don't know like just they didn't treat you as sort of a, a human you know they they treated you as as if you were really well I mean obviously we were all unwell but like they treated you just looking at you like that basically um and it was I mean there were a lot of times I mean I guess I don't really want to go into it it might be quite difficult for some people to hear but you know there were a lot of times where they basically forced medication on you and that can feel really awful really like just you're not treated like I felt like an animal really that can be really demoralizing and really horrible so yeah there, there were times yeah like did they did they have to like monitor you when you were like bathing or was it like yeah so sometimes like for a period of time that like, you might be on what they call one-to-one or two-to-one which basically means you have one nurse watching you all the time or Mm -hmm. two nurses watching you all the time so if you go in the shower you know they would have to be watching you they would be following you all the time um sometimes they'd even have to be what they call arms length away so they would literally be within a meter of you at all times and Uh. honestly it was it was just horrendous you didn't have time you know to even feel like you're in your own brain like you just felt completely it was just it was awful really jeez really tough i can't imagine i mean i can't imagine but i don't i it's it's a struggle for me to sort of um see that as real life obviously because i've I've watched you know a few movies that had you know psychiatric hospitals and stuff but to me, they're always movies. They're never sort of. You just don't think it's real. You don't think it's out there until, really, you experience it yourself because nobody talks about it. Um, re- no, nobody talks about it, and I think it's important to you know make people realise that this stuff does exist and it's it's not right, really. I mean, I know they're doing it to you know for your best interest, but I'm sure there'd be other ways 
other ways around it in the future because it's so demoralizing and so awful to have to go through yeah so let's talk a little bit about sort of like treatments and and medications and stuff like what were the sort of main treatments that you went through and what what were the medications that you put on how did they make you feel um so medication wise I mean I was put on medication when I was 15 um and I suppose the older I got the more medications I got put on um I was looking through before this how many medications I've been on because honestly I had no clue Mm -hmm. um and I think yeah I mean I've been on 14 different types of medication a huge majority of them being antipsychotics I mean I mentioned this earlier um but yeah I mean medication wise I was put on a lot um and I think sort of therapy wise I think it's really it's really hard there's there's very limited therapy when you're actually in hospital their main sort of their main process is to get you on a medication and sort of get you out of there basically they don't they don't do therapy in hospital um I know that private hospitals are different they are very therapy based but unfortunately I didn't have the insurance and whatever to you know be able to go into one of those but I know that they have a lot more therapy um but when I was out of hospital um I guess it's sort of a postcode lottery I mean I know lots of people who you know live in different areas they get different therapies personally in my area um there was sort of minimal therapy I guess um I was so I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder when I was 18 Mm -hmm. and um uh in my area they had a personality disorder service so I was referred from hospital to that service when I was discharged from hospital and um they offered they offered a lot I mean you know they offered two years of therapy um it was quite intensive so like twice a week um and I was with them a year really um and then they eventually said to me you know this isn't this is clearly not helping you I mean it honestly didn't benefit me at all um I honestly I I really didn't relate to what they were talking about I mean I I do believe now that I never had a personality disorder um so again like that was me being completely misdiagnosed um there are therapies available for people and I, I guess it's just it's just luck when it comes down to it if you're in the right area with the right therapy at the right time um so yeah that was my experience with I mean I did go through a lot of other therapies but not really for a long period of time yeah yeah yeah. cognitive behavioral yeah yeah I mean I still I have a therapist now and she's she's honestly amazing like she's you know ongoing I've been with her four years and but that's you know that was privately because they didn't offer that in the NHS so we had yeah. no choice basically if I if I needed that support you know I had to we had to go that way around you know um well in 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 terms of like therapy I know that the that particularly for people with with autism there is a I think they, they did a sort of wide scale survey on our for autistic people and they said and they said that the majority of um, autistic people who have sort of like mental health diagnoses, which is honestly quite a lot, lot, yeah, and severe, yeah. severe in fact, um, don't get the treatment that they feel that they need, or at least mm. the treatment that they are getting isn't sufficient. And I do yeah. think. I think that that autistic people do need a different type of therapy. We need we need someone to actually get the differences at a, at a core level, rather than just have a general awareness of you know autism, Asperger's, and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it has yeah. to be done very differently. 
So I, I went through counselling when I was in my adolescence for about four or five years. Um, yeah. In 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 and out, kind of. And I found mm. zero of the sessions any help at all. If anything, it made me feel more more isolated and misunderstood. Yeah. Um, yeah. They did. Yeah, they did sort can... of put me on medications and stuff. Like I've been on. I mean, I I started on Prozac as you do. Um, yeah. Floxetine. <laughs> Yeah, same. And I had I had that on and off for a few years. Got myself off it on a few occasions. Felt great for about yeah. a week, and then obviously plummeted. Um, yeah. And then I was put on metazapine, which is more of a sort of anxiolytic type sedative drug. Yeah. Yeah. Um, had that for a while. That was kind of during the time that I was that I did my research placement in Thailand. And then um, when I came back, I was put on another, found a really amazing, lovely doctor who put me on oh, yeah. sertraline. And I went oh, yeah. up to a fairly high dose on sertraline. Yeah. Started getting many episodes of panic attacks throughout the day because mm. of it. So they took me off it. Yeah. Now I'm on, I'm on citalopram and, you know, I've, I've been prescribed... Um, that metazapine and now and again when my my panic attacks um a little bit too much they prescribe me you know like typical benzos to yeah to help with that yeah. well I, was, I, was, I wanted i wanted to ask as well because um what what were how how did being on antipsychotics feel like what what were there any differences that you could tell? Yeah, 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 a hundred percent. I mean, a lot of them have really horrible side effects, like for example, weight gain, um, increased appetite, which isn't just like feeling hungry. It's honestly, it's, it ravenous. becomes all you can think about. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> ravenous. Honestly, like just eating twenty four seven and they really affected me and then I guess other things you know you can I mean honestly side effects lists go on forever don't they Mm. um but like you know they they were the main sort of differences as opposed to like an antidepressant I guess I felt like a complete zombie on them because they made me so tired and so sedated that I just I was just asleep pretty much all day um really yeah and I just could not function on them um I really really couldn't I wasn't myself I felt really sort of numbed and empty and just sort of like I was just a robot really just doing what people told me to do and just doing it I didn't I didn't yeah I didn't feel like myself it was they were really um bad for me personally mm-hmm. like I know you know that they're, they're really helpful for a lot of people and I totally have psychosis <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> but um for, for me definitely not good mm. um really bad that's crazy yeah so yeah um I wanted to move on to I I do want to kind of keep questioning about this because obviously yeah. it's, it's quite an interesting thing to talk about. But, you know, time's ticking on, so uh, yeah. Let's uh, so we move on to the the, the next question. Yeah, sure. Why is it that autism can present as mental health illnesses or any sort of related disorders? Do you think that possibly being female got in the way of you being diagnosed of autism in the first place? I think that a lot of people with a late diagnosis of autism actually get diagnosed with mental health illness before being diagnosed as autistic. I think especially this is the case as a female. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also personally feel that there is a bit of discrimination as a female. Um, I feel like we are more likely to get diagnosed with mental health illnesses and not have anyone look into the root cause. I, I think that 
you know, a male presenting with mental illness, I feel like a lot of people look deeper into the cause as to why they're unwell. I mean, I think this is probably due to the stigma around people thinking that it's more common for females to get mental illness, which obviously is not true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously you can be autistic with a mental health illness as well. I mean, you mentioned this earlier, it's actually really common. Um, and quite a high proportion of autistic people do have mental illness as well. But yeah, I think, I think a girl being a girl or female, whatever can really affect how you're diagnosed because I feel like only really in the recent years, research into autistic females has only recently, you know, progressed. And yeah, I mean, I mean, years and years ago, people assumed autism only occurred in men, which is ridiculous and definitely not <laughs> not the case. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like, you know, there's, there's a long way to go still with, you know, research into autistic females, but um, I think it is improving. and also masking is quite common as an autistic female yeah um yeah I think this can lead to a lot of females being misdiagnosed slipping under the radar yeah totally because it's it's very common and you know we we learn to you know hide our autistic self and adapt to different environments and yeah, so I think that's another reason. And I do, I do, um, from from sort of the research that I that I've done, and and my 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 mom is quite a a big sort of figure in the special needs sort of area. She yeah. manages quite a large part of of England for special needs and stuff, oh, and wow. she she talks a lot about um the differences between guys and girls, and from from the research as well it, it seems that that f- females seem to be more c- can mask easier than guys can yeah. like can engage in social mimicry and yeah fit in and, and get an idea of the social environment and slot you slot yourself in and, and copy people and, mm-hmm. and all of that and that seems to be something that's more prevalent in in girls i suppose whereas guys yeah. guys that i've met generally tend to be quite more, more on the side of sort of ice isolated in terms of mm-hmm. not really talking that much at all yeah. and just sort of staying out of people's way and it does seem that there, there is a difference in the way that you know autism occurs socially between the you know genders and, and all that yeah I totally agree yeah I can imagine that even with the rates of you know borderline personality disorder BPD mm. tends to be you know from the research more females so I guess that I, I guess that you know, there'd be more of an inclination for people for doctors and stuff to diagnose people with that females with that stuff rather than sort of dig into the probably in their mind the less probable cause of the differences I guess yeah 100% definitely I mean when I was um in that treatment for borderline personality disorder there was no men absolutely nobody it was just all females the research has only been sort of has been swayed more towards females with borderline personality disorder but maybe males actually present slightly differently with borderline personality disorder mm. if they have it mm. um maybe it's similar in that aspect possibly to do with more aggression more anger management yeah. kind of side of things that would make sense mm. yeah yeah um, and then you obviously have the sort of social influence on both ma- males and females in different ways i guess mm. but it's it's definitely something to sort of tr- try and you know think about and, and study a bit more it's just that i think we're, we're we are at the sort of cusp of starting to understand the human mind a bit more and yeah it's it's difficult because we know we know a lot of things but we also we we know how much we don't know as well yeah and sometimes that can be quite difficult yeah. to uh 
um, work with. Yeah, exactly. But I think we're in a good place at the moment with like research progressing and, you know, people Definitely, beginning to yeah. understand things more. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot better than, say, 10 years ago even. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's a crazy world that we live in, and yeah. I mean, <laughs> cons- considering that a lot of sort of psychop- psychotherapy and psychology work is about recognizing outward displays of symptoms rather than physical causes of mm. symptoms, it can all there, there's a, there is always a a gray area of interpretation yeah. or or human error, I guess. Yeah, that kind of definitely. stuff and it's do you think that if people had more of an awareness of autism and Asperger's around the time that you were sort of um going through all these these sort of traumatic events do you feel like that would have possibly given you a new avenue if you would had known about it to you know sort of a common extent and people around you knew about autism and Asperger's a bit more especially sort of in in schools I feel like I think you know school was the sort of the one time that I was sort of with professionals who you know maybe knew a bit more than sort of my parents my parents really didn't know a lot about autism and stuff I feel like if school had been more aware at the time and sort of picked up on it then yeah I mean it would have Help me a lot and I mean I, I can't I can't you know it's it's a hard thing to think about is it's hard to think you know oh what would my life have been like had I known yeah of course yeah. I was autistic you know earlier on um but I guess all I can do now is sort of you know I'm learning so much more about myself and I feel like I understand myself so much better and I guess you know it's just as cringe as it is it's just like a new chapter in my life you know so yeah I feel like it's just moving on from my past not forgetting it because you know I'm never going to forget it but do you think looking back at those experiences and your journey um did like how how do you process all of that stuff like has has your experience had any negative or I guess he may be positive things. I don't know how they can be positive, but yeah, <laughs> I th- I think um that looking back on my life, in particular looking back on my journey through being with mental health services and in psychiatric hospitals, there's I've still got a huge amount to process, and I think I honestly have had a lot of trauma from being in those hospitals, and I think you know I've I have looked out. A lot of it in my head because I've been so scared to think back to it I think I mean in a positive sort of way I think it has had a huge impact on me because I, I mean I believe I mean positively I believe that it's changed me as a person I you know I'm so much stronger and resilient than I've you know than I ever thought I could be and and I guess I've had such an insight into so many things and I feel like from now on I'm never going to take life for granted and I really do appreciate every little thing yeah I am frustrated that you know I was so misunderstood my whole life but um but you know I have there has been positives you know I I think about the little things in life and I really do appreciate them a lot more so you know that's been the positive and obviously the negative has been how traumatic it was. Those all those experiences give you an insight into things that people would not usually experience, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I guess that gives you gives you a bit bit more of an an understanding for you know, a diff, different way of viewing the world, I guess. As opposed to sort of easy easy going first world first world living. <laughs> Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's why I've sort of dealt with this whole COVID nineteen situation because I've I've had so much chaos in my life that like now I'm just like, well, you know, <laughs> you know, I can I can deal with it. At least I'm at so, home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there have been positives, and it has changed me, and I, I have so much more understanding for sort of people who are going through similar things now. I think because I never knew before that you know people could go through these things. Wow. Well, my my mind is absolutely blown by this this conversation. Is <laughs> It's like yeah. it's it's not not often that you, I that I get to talk to someone who's has had quite the experiences that that you've had, and it's mm. honestly it's been I, I'm I'm very honoured that you you're coming on to talk talk to me about it and talk to other people. Oh. I feel like it, it gives people a better understanding of this stuff, and it's 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 also very brave that you. That you've been so open and, and honest about yeah. your your things. Quite an amazing yeah. person, gotta say. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, I think I think it I think it has. You know, I'm I'm in the place now where I can talk about it. I wouldn't really have been able to talk about this a few months ago, but I really do want to sort of make people understand, you know, mm. about you know, mental illness and the experiences I've been through and um I feel like you know I'm so so grateful that you you asked me to to come on and talk about it because you know I, I really wanted to I really wanted to you know even if it's just to you know help one person I feel that it's really important to talk about it's enough yeah so yeah it's, it's been good is this is the um the fun part of the podcast <laughs> podcast system yeah. um <laughs> which which is obviously said in air quotations yeah what three things that you've mentioned do you think are the most important things to take away what are the most important lessons or things that you want people to really think about when they finish listening okay um i feel like it's just really important to really emphasize that every autistic person is different um I think you know it's important to realize that the stereotypes associated with autism can really leave somebody being misdiagnosed I guess also going back to what we talked about about females um and how you know they can be affected getting an autism diagnosis I feel like that was quite an important thing to talk about because it really is the case. I mean, you know, I mean, I know, you know, research in autistic females is getting better, but I feel like there's still a long way to go. And I feel mm-hmm. like people need to be aware that, you know, this is the case. Probably, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a, you know, researcher, but it might be more even about how many men have autism and how many females have autism, but we, we don't mm-hmm. know until more people understand you know, and, and how more people understand that, you know, females do mask a lot and they're more likely to do so. And I guess, I, I don't know, I guess it was important to talk about psychiatric hospitals. I feel like it's a really untalked about subject. I, I mean, it's a tough subject and a really sort of harsh topic to talk about, but it, it really does need to be talked about. And Going forward, I I think hospital psychiatric hospitals really do need to be more accommodating for autistics because I just I genuinely feel like it's it really is an unsuitable environment for autistic people to be in, and I feel like that needs to change because I really don't think people are accommodating autistics when they're going to hospital. But I, I yeah I just I I do feel like it's important that I talked about you know being in a psychiatric hospital and you know going into that into detail because I feel like people just don't understand they don't know what's going on brilliant thank you very much so we've got the final final little open question that I give to everybody who comes on to talk about autism on this podcast yeah and that is what does autism mean to you (laughs) <laughs> I like. I really like this question actually I suppose autism gives me a huge amount of strengths strengths that I only that I believe I only have because I'm autistic you know I'm extremely creative and I feel I really do feel as though 
I see the world differently, which, you know, really helps with my art and photography because it makes it so unique. I know that we, you know, have struggles, but I believe I do believe if the world became more inclusive and accepting, it would make it easier for us to navigate the world. I'm going to leave you on with one of my favourite quotes. Um, Ooh. <laughs> exciting stuff yeah come on Um, (laughs) it's um it's sometimes attributed to albert einstein but they don't really know but um everybody is a genius but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid i mean this really i just i just love it because for so long i felt i was born on the wrong planet living a life that Mm -hmm. really wasn't mine but you know now i know i'm not and I'm completely meant to be here. Um, you know, being autistic makes me so unique in so many different ways. And I'm so happy that I'm me, I guess. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for so long, I wasn't happy, you know, you know, that I was me and I wasn't happy in the skin that I was in. But, you know, I'm, I'm so much more positive now, um, which is it's really nice. Well, thank you for that. I like I like that little quote. That's Yeah. I think I've, I've heard of, I've heard of it before. It's um. I can't remember who who wrote it. Yeah, it's sometimes sort of linked to Albert Einstein, but I think it's sort of unknown. Really, I don't really know. Maybe it's maybe it's one of those Instagram quotes that <laughs> people say that it's a quote from somebody important, but actually are just saying yeah. it on Instagram, and then <laughs> and then it catches on. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it's a good quote. Yeah, it is. Isn't it's a very it? good quote. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's a little bit don't croaky worry. today. Maybe I'm coming down with. Uh... Oh no! Don't. No, I'll be all right. <laughs> so, do you want to give out some sort of like links and stuff to your social media, or do you want to, you know, give some links to your th- that video that you were talking about before the podcast? Oh yeah. Okay, so I made. A, um, a film on mental health illness last year and basically the the name of the film is A Storied Mind so sort of storied with I-E-D on the end um, and it's on YouTube so you can probably find anyone can find it on there and my Instagram is lots with so L-O-T-T-S voicing autism in your photography page. In my photography page. So many accounts. It's Lottie B Photography on Instagram. Very cool. And I definitely recommend anyone out there to go check out, at least go check out the photography Instagram page because, yeah, some of the stuff on there, it's top top quality oh, stuff. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> I'll have to see if you'll let, let me use some of them for my uh, video thumbnails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Obviously, the Forty Oti podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. So you can always go um, check the episode out on those. You know, maybe sometimes you don't want to be downloading all that data from from YouTube. Sometimes maybe just going on Spotify and checking out the Forty Oti podcast would be a good idea. In terms of my sort of links, of course, the Asperger's Growth YouTube channel. Uh, mental health and autism videos all that kind of good stuff then you've got my social media accounts at Asperger's Growth Facebook Instagram and Twitter and if you want to get in contact and possibly appear on the podcast or have an interesting topic that you want me to talk about you can always email me at aspergersgrowth at gmail.com there is also something that I wanted to mention as well which is the documentary that I'd been working on. I think at this time, the time of recording, I'm still working on it for it to go out, but it's likely that when this recording goes out, when you're hearing this, it's already out there. In the big wide world, it's a documentary called Asperger's in Society, and it's all about the link between autism and mental health. Is it biological? Is it social? Give it a watch. It's free on YouTube. I would... Very much appreciate it. So, Lottie, yeah. have you enjoyed your experience on the Forty Audio podcast? I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I'm beaming. 
I've, no, I've, I've honestly loved it. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like we talked about some really, you know, good, good things. And then, yeah, I've loved speaking with you. Thank you so much. As I said, I'm very grateful that you, you've come on to talk about these experiences and been so honest. And I'm sure you'll get lots of messages from lots of lovely people thanking you for just how open and, and honest and lovely you've been oh. talking about these issues that are obviously quite um, traumatic and, and negative for you. Yeah. It's very yeah. much appreciated. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. This has been your host, Thomas Henley, from the Asperger's Grove channel and the 40 Auti podcast, and Lottie from Lots Voicing Autism Instagram page. Yeah. My my outros are never particularly good because I'm 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 not very good at rounding things up. Um, so do you want to say your goodbyes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Um, yeah, just just thank you um, for listening to my story and just what we've been talking about. Listening to us monologue about <laughs> our life, yeah, <laughs> and our and our thoughts and our. <laughs> Info dumping brains, splurging out information (laughs) into an audio file for it to be converted into ones and zeros and then sent to your listening device and then converted (laughs) back into audio and then translated from from the audio that's coming out of your speakers into (laughs) speech that you can comprehend and understand. I'm so grateful for you (laughs) staying with (laughs) us. Thank you for listening, guys. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.